You're watching Sunrise Daily coming to you from our studios now in Abuja. <laughs> yes, we have a lot of the guests here this morning. And we're now we're being joined by Austin Iwa, who is a retired AIG of police. And we also have with us Daniel Kazai, who is a National Youth President, Congress of Northern Nigerian Christians, and also former National President, Youth Wing of Christian Association of Nigeria. You're welcome to Sunrise Daily, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, the security situation is such that, you know, everyone is concerned now. No matter what part of the country you're in, uh, there's always something that affects you. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think it was, I don't remember if it was this week now, uh, when uh, a Christian leader, I think a local government uh, leader of Cannes was murdered by Boko Haram. Yeah. Last week, it was the Emil Pataskum in Potiskum local mm -hmm. government who was attacked on the Kaduna uh, Zaria Road, and I think about four to six people were killed in that encounter. In the southwest, the controversy is raging uh, over Amotekun, and only yesterday, uh, the leader of the APC, Bolatin Ubu, broke his silence on it. Uh, we've seen some reaction to that this morning. But when you think, when you look in general, I mean, because we also saw some intro videos there, the governor of Benue State also raising the question of herders who, he says, despite the anti-grazing law, uh, seem to be, you know, causing rampage in his state. When you sit down and you take a look at all that is going on in the country, where you where your analytical cap, can you help us make sense of what you see or where we are in the, secu in the area of security? Well, um, for me, I mean, I'll look at it within the context of my background as a police officer. Yeah. Uh, someone that has served in, uh, you know, different parts of the country. And also, I will also look at it within the context of the history of uh, policing in this country and uh, the the aspect that has to do with the continuous and consistent degradation of the capability and capacity of the police and other security agencies to provide safety and security in this country. It didn't just start. It starts, it's, it's more than a 40-year uh, problem that has been with us. If you cast your mind back to the days of the military regime, you will see that uh, the, the, the police and other security agencies, well, the, uh, during the military regime, I think it was just the police then, we didn't have civil defense. The, there was continuous uh, degradation of their capacity to make sure that they did not perform uh, at par and perhaps compete. If you, if you recall uh, very well when uh, General Buhari took over power, uh, we had a police that was structured to provide safety and security. And during that coup, what happened? All the equipments, all the uh, facilities that were, uh, that the Shagari government bought for the police were seized by the military. Because I think, because uh, the military then felt that um, um, the police were a, 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 perhaps in competition with them. And so you have seen this consistency. And then governments over the years have failed to make any policy mm. that will support the police, not one policy. We don't have a national policy on crime prevention. We don't have a national policy on neighborhood policing. We don't have a national policy on policy and strategy on uh, community safety. These are supposed to be policies that will support the government, uh, support the police and other security uh, agencies to give them vision and capacity. Mm. Training but, but has the police them, uh, shall I say, have the police uh, themselves been uh, very truthful and sincere with where we stand in terms of security. You've talked about these policies that we need. It's not for a lack of policies uh, that we have been failing, because if you argue that the degradation uh, of the police started during the military regime, we have had a democracy now for 20 years plus, and the police should have been one of the strongest uh, arms of law enforcement in the country. In fact, it should be the primary arm of law enforcement in the country. Why haven't bright officers been able to speak up 
because they know that, you know, they have a bigger role to play in a democracy. Officers have been speaking up. I am speaking up, even though I'm retired, but I'm speaking up. Now, you, you need to uh, understand that uh, in 1999, when Nigeria decided to go democratic ways, uh, there was no transition. There was no deliberate transition from a military based system of governance to a democratic base. Of How did governance. that affect the police? It affected the police in numerous ways. But then again, police was the only institution that made attempts at democratizing itself by adopting community policy. But then again, did we get any kind of support? Did the police get any kind of uh, government support in that direction? Mm. And then internally again, again uh, a lot of officers didn't really understand what community policing actually meant. So for some of us who were involved in that process, we had to under, uh, undertake a lot of sensitization uh, programs and awareness programs to ensure that officers clearly understood. But then we were coming from a culture that was very difficult to do away with. Mm. Let, let me interrupt yeah. you. Let, mm. let me go to Mr. Kazai. Yeah. Um, it's so sad what is happening, um, or what we've seen in the, in the unfortunate killing of the Reverend from Adamawa. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of the progress that has been made uh, on the war against terrorism and how it affects um, the security situation in the northeast of the country? Thank you very much. Um, my assessment of the war against terrorism in Nigeria is uh, below average <clears throat> because um, I was in Michika when uh, Boko Haram struck, attack, and kidnapped the Reverend uh, Lawal Endemi. Lawal Endemi happened to be a Reverend with my own denomination where I come from. We, What's the denomination? That's uh, Church of the Brethren, UIN Church. Uh, he was the DCC secretary here in Abuja uh, before he was transferred to Michika to hold the office of the DCC secretary as well. When these people came into Michika in the evenings of the 2nd of uh, January, Endimi was in his house and everybody was running away. And uh, uh, Michika is a community or a local government with a population of over 350,000 people who are living in Michika. Then we have people who are outside Michika, uh, uh, close to about 300,000 as well. Now, that man is a peace-loving uh, gentleman, a pastor who is known by all the people who are in the community, who has always worked for the peaceful coexistence of both the Christians and the Muslim in that community. But what really, uh, what really got us confused is the fact that that man was picked and taken to Sambisa Forest in less than 20, 48 hours. We saw him on the national, on, on YouTube and other social media, uh, making statement. I met uh, Indimi. I was in his church in the early hours of uh, the new year. That's first of uh, January, 2020. Um, when was he kidnapped? Because we understand that second, you saw him second a of, few moments before he was kidnapped. Yes, uh, second of January, 2020. He was kidnapped. And um, uh, we talk about security and uh, the fight against terrorism in Nigeria. Uh, from my background, or as the leader of the Christian Association of Nigeria, the former leader of the Christian Association of Nigeria, youth wing of, youth wing of Khan, I, I can't tell you categorically clear that the fight against terrorism, as far as we're concerned, is not satisfactory to us because we have lost so much. We lost so much of our people. A lot of our members are displaced. As I speak to you, we have over, over 30,000 Christians from Borno 
Adamawa that moved away from Nigeria to Cameroon. Only EYN Church has about 15,000 or more than that. A majority of these people are young teenagers and women who lost their loved ones, their husband, in the course of this crisis. And uh, again, when you talk about the damages done on the church, we lost 3,257 churches. Just UIN Church lost 3,257 as of yesterday to this insurgency. And we have more than 100,000 members displaced from Adamawa, Borno, Yobi. You can see them here in Abuja, Masaka area, Mararaba. You go to Edo State, they are there. You go to places like Nasarawa State, I mean, uh, yeah, Nasarawa, Plateau State, you have them there along Mangu Road, and the rest of it. So when you go to Benue, I was, I was in Guma local government. I, 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 I was in tears. I came back, I couldn't eat, because I visited IDP camp where they are hosting over, over 32,000 people. And out of the 32,000, I saw over 12,000 teenagers, between, I mean minors, between the ages of uh, 10 down to zero. I was physically there. So if we have this number of people displaced from their communities, and all we hear from the security is that we're on, to on top of the situation, uh, everybody can go back to his community, I don't think this is fair to Nigerians. I don't think we are actually truthful to ourselves. I don't think uh, we've done enough as a nation to protect our citizens. Um, uh, like you said, I traveled by road from Abuja to, to Yola last week. From here to Yola should take someone not less than 10 hours, maximum 10 hours or let's say nine hours. But you'll be on this road for nearly 14 hours to get to Yola. You see checkpoint at every maybe 15, 20 kilometer, but still yet you see people being kidnapped. You, 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 you also uh, notice that robbery is still taking place. And uh, uh, we have securities on the road. They kidnap our leaders only December. Christians lost, I mean, Christian leaders that were kidnapped, kidnapped uh, I think, are more than 50. You know, I don't want to make, because everybody would, at the end of the day, go back home and, you know, count their losses. Uh, and that's how it will be, you know, that Christian leaders will go and look at how many of their members have been affected. Uh, they would look at how many churches they've lost, how many people have been displaced. But I want to ask you, because really this is personal and, and, you know, it is also very emotional when you talk about the people whom you saw in the IDP camps. No. Would you say that it's, what, when you talk about the losses, is as a result of a targeting of Christians or this is as a result of the general insecurity that has characterized uh, or what the Northeast has seen in the last years since Boko Haram became a problem? Well, I, I am looking at it from, from two perspectives. First, I, I see it as a persecution of Christians because uh, if, you have, if, you, if you have a situation where people will go and attack a community that is predominantly Christ, a Christian a community, let me give you an example. Chibok is... I think 85 to 90 percent Christian. In Dimi, the late reverend that was executed is, uh, is from Chibok local government. You are aware of the story of the Chibok girls that were kidnapped years back. And out of the 249 uh, Chibok girls that were kidnapped, I, 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 I'm just trying to give you a kind of a figure so you can understand what uh, the Indimi group are facing and also the way they are looking at the whole of this thing. 197 are members of Indimi's church. And 
the other number goes to other denominations. And these people were taken away since 2014, and up to today, we've not been able to secure. Now, let me ask you. Let let's not forget, you, you know, I, when you look at the number of people that Boko Haram has killed, and I'm not trying to make you change your perspective. I'm just trying to bring out, you know, an objective assessment yeah. of this. When you look at the number of people that Boko Haram has killed so far, the number of people who have been affected or displaced by the insurgency, we understand that in Borno alone, about 1.8 million people have been displaced. Mm. They are in, um, some of, a lot of them are in IDPs, but even more are with families and within communities. Yeah. Um, this has affected, it would seem, both Christian and Muslim populations. And it would seem that right now, there is now an attempt to even escalate the crisis even further, which is one of the things that people are afraid of. So, for instance, when the reverend was killed, the president did say it was provocative. Very, very, very well. It, 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 it perhaps was an attempt to ensure that Christians felt that way. Mm. Uh, perhaps to, to also ensure that there are divisions within the fight against terrorism. No. Do you think that we stand the chance of falling into that trap of divisions within what is supposed to be a joint fight against a force that is looking to just terrorize everybody? Thank you very much. We are at the risk of falling apart. If government do not sit up to carry out her assignment, the primary assignment of each government is the protection of life and properties of her citizens. If someone who has committed an offense or committed a crime in the city can be tracked, we have all the facilities. What happens? They shoot these videos, they send it on YouTube, they send it on Facebook. What effort is the government of the day doing to be able to use technology to curtail this, this embarrassing uh, onslaught by these terrorists. Uh, we also know for sure that when they abducted the, 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 the reverend, some, something was, 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 uh, was, was asked for. They demanded for money. And uh, though I was not part of the negotiation or whatever, but from what I read on, this, uh, on the social media, is that they demanded for 2 million euros, which is about, uh, about 900 and something million naira. A church that has lost over uh, 3,250 churches and lost so many members. Where will they raise that kind of money? And out of sympathy of members and uh, well-wishers, you know, uh, and also good citizens of this country, the church, according to what I read, was able to raise 50 million naira as a ransom. But that was turned down and, uh, you know, resulting into the execution of the innocent man. So if government will sit up and the Christian leaders and the, the Muslim leaders and all stakeholders in this country will come together mm. and put aside this sentiment, put aside this division, Put aside this, uh, this, uh, this hypocrisy, because I look at it as hypocrisy. All of us are being consumed by this, 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 this disaster. They should come together. People should not be firing each other on the social media. We feel embarrassed as young people when we read stories from uh, the other leader countering the other leader and the other leader countering. And I don't see, I don't see much from government trying to bring these people together. The young people are there. I was, I'm the immediate past national president of the youth wing of Khan, and currently the national president of the Congress of Northern Nigerian Christians. When, why can't you bring all of us together on a round table? What do we do? These are young people that are there. Some of them are there by accident. Mm. Well, <clears throat> Mr. Awar, mm. I'm sure you can see that the problems are a lot. Indeed. Um, and in the north, it is getting even more peculiar. Let's not forget that uh, in Yola, or in Yobe State, when uh, children were kidnapped, secondary school children were kidnapped, uh, almost all of them were returned, apart from one, uh, Leah Sheribo. Mm. And you mm. have seen how that has, you know, incensed 
uh, the Christian Association of Nigeria who keep also asking, in addition to all many Nigerians, that her rescue be secured. But it would seem right now that there is a deliberate attempt by this sect to exploit even further our fault lines. Where, how do you see, do you see any concerted effort by the federal government to continue to unite the people along a common, uh, or to fight a common enemy? Yeah, um, just like you said, he said that um, there should be an attempt by the, the different uh, religious bodies to come together and, and, and talk. For me, I have not uh, seen any leader come out publicly, publicly yes, from both uh, religious groups, come out publicly and condemn what is going on and offer a uh, solution. So, uh, the How do you mean? In terms of Boko Haram attack? In terms of Boko Haram uh, We're talking of Northeast. Yes. In terms of the Boko Haram attack, uh, we haven't seen, just like he has said, leaders of maybe uh, era, uh, some of the religious groups in the Islamic uh, uh, areas and the Christian areas actually coming out together uh, to, to say something about it or even to uh, jointly visit these areas and even raise funds or raise any resources to support these people to, uh, to make us believe that, yes, both the Christians and the, the, the Muslim communities uh, are, are have one voice and are talking, talking about this. And um, with, I mean, when this whole crisis started, uh, it was like an attack on Christians because Christian churches were targeted. And after some time, we, we started seeing mosques and Muslims also being attacked. And so the whole problem now had took another uh, uh, perspective. We didn't know what these people wanted again, whether they wanted an Islamic uh, republic or uh, they, they wanted, it, it, it became outright crime uh, for some of them. And now it has become a business. Government, from my understanding, has been doing a lot through the military uh, uh, excursions in, in those areas. And uh, I think government can, on its own, also um, reach out to both the Christians and the Muslims and try to see how uh, both uh, bodies, religious bodies, can come together and speak with one voice. But right now, uh, we are hearing different voices from all kinds of area, and each one is pointing accusing fingers and raising more of uh, uh, sentiments that are uh, religious sentiments. And, uh, and uh, it's not helping the situation. Is this something that worries you, though, the religious yeah. sentiments which you hear? Yeah, it worries. Yeah. Because um, everybody, I mean, the Christians feel that they are particularly singled out and attacked. The Muslims feel that the Christians don't understand what is going on and should not label this as a religious uh, uh, war. And so, uh, but there is no area of convergence of, of, of thinking Opinion. and ideas uh, for, for, for the rest of the country to know that, yes, uh, both uh, uh, religious bodies uh, 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 oppose what is going on. Mm. Yeah. Uh, let's take a break at this moment. We will come back and, uh, you know, take questions from my colleagues in Lagos. Um, they will de definitely have questions for you. But just before we go on break, I, let me quickly ask you, uh, have there been attempts to reach out across the, you, 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 I don't want to say a divide, because sometimes these divides could be superficial. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes you might find that, you know, I don't know, maybe in the same community, Christians and Muslims will reside. Uh, they, they sometimes celebrate together. They, you know, attend, I don't know, naming ceremonies and things of the sort, perhaps, together. Have there been attempts to reach out in terms of their outside of the, you know, the, let me say, ethnic considerations to, through formal institutions of the religious bodies to try and, you know, come to a consensus as to how, what the approach should be when it seems that there are attempts to divide even further uh, what some people could say could be the fragile unity which we, we currently enjoy. Uh, I, I like the word you use, fragile unity. And I, you remember I mentioned something earlier on. I talked about the, the propaganda and the hypocrisy. 
when you have people come together under interfaith, hold a meeting, and after the meeting, they part ways, the man from the north goes to the north, the man from the south goes to the south, that part of Nigeria, or the Christian go back to his own uh, community, the Muslim go back to, goes back to his own community, and you see fireworks. The Christians are saying, see what happened to us. Please, government, pay attention. And nobody seems to do anything about it. Let me give you an example. This whole thing is as a result of the suspicion that has been existing between the people of Nigeria, especially the two, the two religions. Uh, the Christians feel that we've been complaining since the beginning of the current administration that there should be balances in the security architecture of Nigeria, uh, where you have the whole security apparatus uh, headed by one religion is not too uh, comfortable for, for the, the Christians. And they feel that, uh, does it mean that no single Christian is uh, trusted to hold that position? You have from the, the, uh, the DSS, the army, the police, the whatever. These are these discussions within the domain of the Christian community. And uh, they, 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 I, I believe that uh, if such issues keep coming up for, for years, uh, government should look into the matter because the, that suspicion is, is growing daily on a daily basis and the suspicion is becoming too big. Mm -hmm. When these people come to kill, they shout, Allahu Akbar. So you begin to wonder how comes with all the security arrangement on ground, you still see people being kidnapped. Where do they follow? Are they spirit? Mm. Yeah. Let's go to Lagos now and take questions from my colleagues. Well, thank you, Malque. I'd like to begin with uh, uh, former AIG, Mr. Austin Uwar. Um, you mentioned some policies that you know we do not have, uh, you know, in terms of uh, internal security and all of that. Does the absence of these policies that you mentioned earlier, you mentioned three of them, does it suggest or question God's commitment to um, internal security? I didn't, I didn't get that very clear. Uh, yeah, let me, let me try to... Re to be a little yeah. Yes, you, you, you said the other time, you mentioned about three policies of government. I hope you can hear me now. You mentioned about three policies that we do not have, you know, that's uh, not made the police to be able to do what it's supposed to do well enough. Does the absence of those policies question government's uh, commitment to internal security? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the absence of uh, these uh, policies questions uh, government's commi uh, commitment to uh, internal security in several ways, you know. And it is because of this lack of focus and lack of direction that the government has not been able to provide that, uh, that uh, you find the, a lot of spaces that are now being occupied by vigilantes, by neighborhood watch uh, organizations, by uh, even state governments creating their own uh, security office as against the grain of the Constitution, as, as against what the Constitution provides. If, for example, we had a national policy on crime, on, on community safety, government will give us a direction as, of how, uh, as to how communities will be protected and the players and the, the, uh, the policing actors that will be involved in providing the, uh, the type of security that we need. If we had a national policy on crime prevention, for example, it would mean that uh, security agencies will begin to, uh, we, we, security agencies on their part will begin to focus on uh, proactive ways and start looking at uh, the real causes of crime in our communities. And then it will also involve government agencies that are supposed to provide some level of uh, strategic support uh, with regards to uh, safety and security. For example, what is the role of what is the role of uh, a minister of youth, for example, minister of youth and social development with regards to uh, 
with regards to uh, crime prevention, for example? What, what would be the role of the Minister of Justice, for example, in terms of crime prevention? What would be the, the role of the uh, Minister of Health in terms of uh, crime prevention? Because we're having uh, uh, public health issues now that has to do with, with uh, drug addiction, and drug addiction is also related to crime. So uh, policies like these give focus not only to security agencies, but to other uh, agencies that have, a, that have a responsibility in ensuring that uh, there's safety and, uh, and, and security uh, within uh, our communities. Mr. Uh, we, uh, very, just, uh, just one, just one moment, Mr. Owa, on just one moment. Uh, whose responsibility, which agency of government or which officer of government was supposed to come up with these policies that you mentioned and why has the police not said anything about it over the years? Well, it's government. It's a government policy. It's not a new thing. It is not, we are not uh, creating... You say uh, government. A, a wheel. We are Mr. not Iwa, when you say wheel. When you say you go government... To other parts of the sir, world. one moment, one moment, sir. When you say government, who in government? Can you give us a specific? Is it the office of the IG? Is it the police service commission? Oh, okay. Is it the national security advisor? Who is supposed to uh, come up with these policies? We have the office of the national security advisor that has a responsibility also for internal security that should contribute to the development of policy. We have the minister of police affairs now that should also contribute to the development of uh, uh, some of these policies. We also have the police that should uh, also be part of uh, giving information as to how those policies can be framed. So it's a multi-agency uh, uh, and, uh, and cross-governmental approach that should be used. But what we see now is that government has left everything that has to do with security to the police and other security agencies without even resource support, without even any policy direction and, uh, and, and anything that uh, these organizations need to, uh, to, to make them more functional and uh, more focused in providing the necessary uh, services that we have. And you know, like I said, it is because of lack of these defined policies that you have spaces. And like I said initially in this program, Consistently, government has, uh, governments over the years have degraded the police to such an extent that you now have all this talk that is coming, Amotekun, a neighborhood watch, state governments creating their... It's because there has been ungoverned spaces over the years that the security agencies have not been able to fill because of neglect. And what do you expect communities to do? They have to go into self-help community projects, vigilantes, neighborhood watch, and now we have uh, states that are creating outfits that, 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 that uh, they, they, they need to provide security for themselves. Okay. And then uh, you have the debate for state police again. It is because the formal governmental protection has failed. Uh, but one of the things that, of course, he agrees with you on the policies, one of the things that he talks about is the regional approach, uh, the peculiarities of each region, which he agreed you know, with uh, uh, my colleague Cardi here. Uh, taking a regional approach to policing as, a, as opposed to uh, unitary uh, policing as we have it largely now, uh, what's the difference and what do you think are the merits or demerits of either? Uh, well, um, now, what we have is a national police, and that is what the Constitution recognizes. Anything outside uh, the characteristics of a national police is an aberration to the Constitution. And just like we were saying, if we need regional police or state-based police, the Constitution is there. The, the, the legislators, the senators should sit together and define how a regional or a state-based police uh, should be. Uh, for me, I believe that governments, state governments have a role to play in, 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 in the security of their states, and that whatever uh, 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 policy that may be brought out should define the role of, uh, of, 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 of governors. Governor, I mean, as somebody who, who was commissioner of police in some states, I know that governors do a lot to support 
uh, the policing of their states. However, this support is not structured, it's not constructive, it's not, it's not, within, the, it's not, it's not within the confines of any budgetary allocation or anything. And what they do is that they give you some money to help you run your, your, your office. Be, I mean, just support. It's not, it, has, it has no constitutional backing. And in some states, the governors don't even support the police. But if we had a, a role to be played, I mean, we have examples other places. In, in UK, for example, I mean, most of us are familiar with UK. In UK, you have a tripartite system of managing the police. You have the home office there, you have uh, the, uh, the police authority. Now you have the police and crime commissioners, that is our political appointment. And you have the, uh, the chief officers, that is like the commissioners of police. These are the three bodies that are brought together to run the police in such a way that there's no, uh, uh, there's no uh, domination of one uh, or manipulation. And then we talk about police, but we have not really talked about how do you insulate the police from political uh, manipulation, from political, from, uh, from governors using, uh, or, or, or states using the police for, for their political gains. We don't even talk about that. We talk about state police, but I think the, I think the, the main debate should be uh, how do you insulate the police and the commissioner of police, the IG and others from political influence and also, what role should the police? But I support the idea that governors should be given a constitutional responsibility, a constitutional role in running, in, uh, in influencing how the, uh, the policing in their state should be arranged. Okay, well, let, let me bring this to uh, Mr. Daniel Kazai, the National Youth President, Congress of Northern Nigerian Christians. Um, you mentioned some things the other time, and it's definitely something of concern. And you also talked about the, the population of Michigan local government being in the region of 350 to 400,000. So I'm just wondering um, if you think there are enough policemen or security uh, uh, provision for the 350, 400,000 people in uh, Michigan local government that could even give way to that kind of uh, uh, kidnap happening of a prominent person like uh, Reverend Andimi. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I think the AIG has spoken so very well about the security arrangement in the country. Uh, I quite agree with him that the policies put in place by, uh, the, 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 by our constitution or the government is not sufficient to be able to a kind of uh, empower the police to a kind of discharge their duties uh, hitch free and uh, uh, without any uh, of this kind of challenges. Um, in Michika, I can't tell you very specific that uh, uh, when these things do happen, sometimes uh, for lack of equipment and also logistics, the police will also be on their feet running along with the civilians. We've seen it 2014. It also happened 2015. And even the last one in January, January 2nd in Michika, these people come with more sophisticated weapons. And when they come, the police will tell you that their vehicles are not even serviceable. And the, 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 like you said, uh, a government or the, the chairman of the local government is also underfunded because you, you, you discover that even the, the resources, I mean the allocation from the federation account to local government is sometimes being hijacked either by the governors. And so the people at the grassroots are, are the receiving end. They are always at the receiving end. I, I, I have said it earlier on, if all of us will not come together, if we fail to come together, this country is going to face a serious problem. Uh, uh, for example, from, from Yobe, 
Uh, let me quickly pose a question. Sorry to interrupt you. Let me quickly pose a question that, you know, relies on our coming together. Uh, in the Southwest, some people will say that how religion plays out is very different from how it plays out in the in North, the North yeah. for instance. Uh, the Southeast and South, South, perhaps. Uh, maybe how it plays out in different regions of the country is very different. So in places where there is usually distrust, mm. uh, where there's suspicion yes. um, between the two religions, yes, sir. How do we see something like a community policing outfit working? I don't know if you want to quickly. Let, let me quickly ask him first. Yeah. Um, In two minutes, if you can. You know, one of, one, of the, one of the advantages of having community policing, but let me just make this clear, yes. that uh, uh, I've been listening to a lot of talk on the concept of community policing, and I think that governors don't understand what community policing is all about. It's a police-driven program. It's not a community-driven program. I think that should be made clear. It's a policing program it's that uh, uh, it's proactive. It's just about proactive policing. And uh, it, it requires the police to go to the fundamental responsibility of policing, which is prevention of crime. Okay. And so, so uh, in a community that uh, have problems that has to do with uh, divide, you know, we, we trust, say that we, yeah. don't like, we don't like that word divide. Uh, community policing helps to bring people together through engaging with the different uh, interest groups within the community under a platform that makes them uh, recognize that, first of all, they have a common problem within their communities, and that secondly, they have to do something about that problem. Okay, let me also, you, you talk about Amotikun uh, Abi and also the, the community policing. Yeah, I'm talking, I, yeah. I want to take it back to you. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion about Amotikun uh, and also uh, the Hizba police? What is your opinion? I have absolutely no opinions on that. So if the, I do, the there AIG, will not be, what is your not opinion? Be you have, on this you have the, the. My point is this the yeah. point I'm trying, I mean, he has talked about the issue of uh, trust. The question I'm asking you is, if the police should drive the process of community policing, given the, uh, well, I say the distrust which already exists, the suspicions which you already exercise and the fears you already expressed, yeah. will it work for you in your community, in the, in the areas that you think have been affected very uh, seriously by the security uh, challenges we have? If we have good representatives or representation in the constitution of this community policing, where you have credible people who are representing the various interests, mm -hmm. I feel the community policing is okay. Mm -hmm. But a situation where you see a kind of a lopsided arrangement in constituting the whole system creates a lot of suspicion. Mm -hmm. And this is what I was trying to mention earlier on. Since 2015, that the new administration, uh, yeah, the administration of uh, President Muhammad Buhari constituted the, the security uh, architecture. Uh, architecture. Mm. Khan came out and cried loud that let there be balance in the, the, in the, in the system. Mm. They feel that the Christians are being marginalized mm. in uh, such a situation. So, and since then, nothing has been done up to today. Well, gentlemen, we have to say thank you so much for coming on Sunrise Daily. I must point out, though, that in the Southwest, Amotekung has not known um, Christians or Muslims. I think they're mm. generally, there's been a general bias. And that is why I say, what about, what's but your I, I, opinion I, I, about Hispa in the North? We have to go now. Thank you so much for coming on Sunrise Daily. Austin Ewa is a retired AIG of police. And Daniel Kazai is a National Youth President, Congress of Northern Nigerian Christians, and former National President, Youth Wing of Christian Association of Nigeria, your weekend.